hello. Welcome to the Procurement Games Podcast and Open Conversations, where we post a question, is the field ever leveled in our favor? Of course, we are talking about procurement and contracting of minority, women, and veteran-owned small businesses deemed to be the underutilized firms in government and private corporation contracting. So, my name is Arlen Pingle, and I am a proud Filipina-American entrepreneur. I lead Mackey Company, a strategic consulting organization focused on procurement supply chain management. We basically help government agencies and private companies design race, ethnic, and gender-conscious contract policies and procedures. More importantly, we help folks like you build capacity, capability, and sustainability. We hope that with the stories we share of entrepreneurs like yourself, that you learn a thing or two to help you strategize for the win. Each week, we feature a minority, veteran, or women-owned small business. And once a month, we feature a trailblazer who is paving the way to help move us forward in this ever-challenging and changing world of procurement. The topics we discuss can be sensitive, but it brings to light the issues and concerns in today's policies, procedures, and how they are implemented in procurement. It is time we have a seat at that table right from the start. This podcast is designed to bring solutions to the concerns of minority, women, and veteran-owned small businesses. The expression of their entrepreneur journey is personal, and that is what we bring forward today. You know what I love about bringing in new guests in our studio? It's the impact that they made to the community and the personalities behind the madness of entrepreneurship. I have Desira Galloway, the CEO and Executive Director of Wellspring Second Chance Center. It is here in the Twin Cities. And Desira, I am so excited to have you here. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Lynn? Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, we have a format here on our show where we kind of get to know you a little bit. It, you know, how Desira came to be Desira, right? So I'd like to learn a little bit more about you and then we'll jump into what Wellspring Second Chance Center does, how it serves community and some of the challenges that it's faced in the industry. And perhaps we can talk about how the industry needs to shift its thinking and its mindset towards our returning citizens. So with that said, Desira, tell me about you. Straight out of undergrad, I, my first job was at a halfway house. So that lets you know, 38 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and there was just something about that field that just kind of grabbed my attention. And hence that time, I've worked for several different agencies to include but not limited to government and then um, nonprofits. While doing so, work, working for uh, Hennepin County, working with families that were involved in systems such as child protection, foster care, it, it was at that time that I got a itch, uh, kind of a need and uh, just a kind of a burning inside my spirit to do more, to make a, a larger impact in what we were doing, just working with families that are involved in child protection. My position changed when I started seeing family members and friends and co colleagues becoming involved in the judicial system. And so already systems are hard, they're hard on families. They um, cause trauma sometimes unknowingly, and I made it my, my utmost focus that I, if I was to do anything, if I was to start a program, which I did and do, indeed do, that I would not re-traumatize our families that we serve. And so after being an investigator for tw 24 years, I made a decision to open up my own agency. And that mm -hmm. started prior to my leaving Hennepin County. And when I mentioned it to my colleagues, they said, oh, Des, I believe you. Um, can I come work for you when you open up your agency? And I thought it was kind of funny, but they knew I was serious and they knew the personality and the commitment and the compassion I had had, you know, for this kind of work, helping at families that are needing a source and a resource to for safe stability. Okay. So the inspiration was set. Yes, it was already there. I just needed to um, to put it in play, really. And so at in two thousand. 
8th, I approached Dorsey and Whitney with my idea, and they were so impressed. It's like, yes, we'll do it pro bono. And so it took us a, a year and a half to get it all ready and, and launching. And we launched in 2010, about November 2010, and with the mission that we would meet all the basic needs, promote self-sufficiency, assist and protect the vulnerable and marginalized people, and then preserve families right, through efficient and cost-effective delivery of services. The services that we provide are great. They are an array of services that provide emergency response and advocacy that strengthens one's protective uh, factors and build resilience in culturally responsive ways that enhances our well-being and the family and the community connections. So our our nonprofit is Wellspring Second Chance, and what we do, we provide trauma-informed response, recovery, restoration, housing, and employment services to individuals that are impacted by poverty, incarceration, unemployment, domestic violence, community violence, and more recently, COVID-19 to support our communities of color to overcome their uh, hardships and then again to thrive. And so that tells you a little bit about who I am from the standpoint of as a professional. Des, you do some amazing work. And I'm really curious to know what got you into this? I got to this place because of my own chaotic background as a child. I was an introvert, but I was a studious person, Mm -hmm. right? I threw myself in education because I was feeling really not appreciated, um, loved, And I had some issues of abandonment because I was in an orphanage for my first three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is really some of why I am drawn to people that are struggling. Because that was kind of my story as well. The thing about you, Des, and Wellspring Second Chance is that your story and the rise from being in an orphanage, desiring love and wanting a sense of belonging, that is relatable. And that is what resonates with your clients who look for those very same things. You made a commitment to make a difference. You made a commitment so that they don't feel so left out. See, that's what entrepreneurship is all about. That you have a product and a service that makes sense for your clients. And more importantly, that you're servicing and filling a need. Luckily... I there was people that cared about me enough that was outside of the family that said that they said something in me and I have a propensity to drive that home even in my agency everybody that comes through my door I am client centered focused in our in our um, off, off offering of services but I'm also strength based I, I I know what I get from the county attorney or the public defender's office or child protection as it relates to why they are referring to our agency. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking for everybody's not totally bad. There's good in everybody. I look for the strength in the individuals that come through my office. Young and old, we provide services to young youth as young as 13 and as old as as I think the oldest has been 58. And so in the 10 years, we probably have now served a good thousands of people, you know, at least wow. 1,800 people, you know. Success and of the program. It is. And with little money, Lynn, <laughs> I have to throw that in there because I am a minority female led in a predominantly white male led industry, which is dealing with ex-offenders to include youth as well as adults. I am not always the first choice, sure. right, in, in funding, in services, right? But one thing no one can resist is that we do good work. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in what John Lewis says. It's about good trouble, good work. You know what I mean? Um, Because I am a minority-led agency, I come from that perspective. I bring that with me. And the um, the persons that work for me, the psychologists, the mental health providers, the case managers, even some ex-offenders who work for for my agency, right? So second chances, that's a big thing in the program for individuals in need. The support system has got to be strong, I would imagine. I believe in second chances. 
I'm a philosopher of second chances. And with that, I mean, even the second chance that came to me and my opportunity, because I was on that road to destruction myself as a very young kid, because I was so angry. And I think that's one reason why I offer anger management to this day, mm-hmm. right? Um, I was an angry kid, but I was able to get counseling. I was able to get the services that I needed to um, change that trajectory. So I bring that home in my own agency. When I listen to you talk, I can hear the passion, and I can not just the passion, but the compassion yes. that you have, the empathy yes. right? Yes. that you have, because you understand that struggle. Yes. Right? Yes. You have, you, you were in the front seat yes. of that movie. Yes. And you took on the stance that this has got to stop. And I've got to do everything in my power to change, like you said, the trajectory of individuals that are in any program. Right. It's in any program coming out of of the facility and, you know, you're lost. You don't have your identity and you did something wrong and you've acknowledged it and you've been punished for it. So how do we change the course so that it doesn't go back? The word that I can never pronounce recidivism. Yes. Recidivism. And that to me is what you are trying to prevent, the repetition yes. of a crime. Yes. And we talk about how that impacted you. You shared how that impacted you. Let me correct myself. And while you didn't get to that stage yes. where you were incarcerated, right. you could have been on that path. Yes. Because that, that path was cleared for you. In a negative way. The path was cleared for you. And I don't want to say you were predisposed because that's a lot of assumptions there. Mm -hmm. But it's hard not to make that recognition. Mm -hmm. And again, you realize at a young age, Mm -hmm. that's not my path. That's not the path I want to go. It's clean and awesome and beautiful and, and, you know, destiny. You know, you could have gone down that path. Mm -hmm. You took the road Mm -hmm. that had not been taken. I am enamored. I'm wowed by that. That is that is an amazing path. Des, I can't tell you how proud I am of the work that you're doing. Now, to our listeners, I do want to let you know about the development of the Choice Program because I know that from what you've shared before, this program was created because your organization found that almost 85% of youth and their parents experience at least one traumatic event in their lives or have adverse childhood experiences. I also love the fact that the CHOICE program will soon be offered to 11th and 12th graders and that it provides an apprenticeship program for continuous personal development and growth. That is just an awesome thing for me. Let me switch this up a little bit now that we know what Wellspring Second Chance Center is about and what Desira is about. Let's talk about what's working and what's not working in the industry. Let me go macro and understand what's going on. Tell me a little bit about that world, the returning citizens world, and then share Uh, You know, the successes and the failures of the industry. What is it existing in the system that's just not working? One of the things that I've noted (laughs) in this work is that the bureaucracy can contribute to re-victimization or re-traumatization of an individual. And when you re-traumatize, you're not helping. You're hurting the individual. Okay, so the person is returning into to society from being incarcerated. And they are told that they have to get a job, they are told to find that they have to secure housing, they're told that they have to do da 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 da, the list goes on and on. But what they did not tell them is that it's gonna be difficult. Because the society is not open to your returning. Sure. People don't believe in, for the most part, a second chance, right? And the bureaucracies that are in place well, will cause you to feel like you can't make it either. And so when you talk about nonprofit work, such as Wellspring versus big corporations or public services, you know, that, that people have to go through for aid, they have to jump through so many hoops 
to get their needs met, basic needs. If sure. you remember what I said in my mission statement, we're about addressing the basic needs of an individual. So when a person is faced with already the uh, idea of having to locate housing, secure a livable wage job, that's a lot of stress. Yes. And we know that without staples in place, housing is a staple. Well, the acclimatization back in society um, barriers. is a barrier. Yes. And then now you've got to put the pressure of, I got to find a place to live. I got to get a job. I got to do all of these non-normal things for me. And I've got X amount of time to do this. Yeah. I don't want to say it. Are returning citizens being set up to fail? Well, we don't want to say that, but it kind of feels that way. And that's how they view it. I've, I've served so many individuals that have come through my door. They've called. Most call first. Some come through the doors. Some are referred. Some are told by friends, go to Wellspring Second Chance, right? Because once you enter our doors and you go through one service program, right, whether that's domestic violence, whether that's anger management, once you enter our doors and you're already participating in, the, in our programming, you become a part of our family. Nice. That means you're not just going to be receiving that particular service that you were referred for. You can get all the other services that we provide, advocacy services, right, employment services, right, counseling. Basically a one-stop shop. Uh, so it's basically wraparound services. Wrap services. And without the bureaucracy, without having to provide this, 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 and this before you see me. Have this form of this or have that form of that, right? That makes us different from other other agencies like, you know, county, county services. County services, they they stop right at that door when you can't provide a certain document. Mm. We do not stop at that door. We will work with you to get what you need, that document, and we will start providing the service right away. So you meet them where they're at. We are definitely meeting this, meeting the participants or the client where they are at. Again, we are talking from the lens of people have lived experience. We know how it feels to be turned away from an agency or from a place that said they would help you because you don't have sure. a certain document sure, sure, in sure. hand. So your organization obviously has had success. Yes. And that is awesome and who's been your champion who's been championing for wellspring second chance other than yourself has someone been advocating for you i hear that you know counties are reaching out to you cities are Mm -hmm. reaching out to Mm -hmm. you but do they really believe i think when people speak to me they feel the passion and the compassion that i have for this field for what the work that we do, which is good work, right? The advocacy, providing stability, you know, removing the hardship, helping them process their trauma, right? So they can move past it and that no longer become a barrier. Trauma-informed care is necessary in the work that we do, right? It's not, okay, you committed the crime, but why did you commit the crime? What was the underpinnings of the issue? What was really going on with you when you did it? And that brings us to programs like the Pathway Program that, um, that we facilitate and we provide all the services to. We do the healing of the trauma. We're getting to the core of the reason. This speaks to public safety. If you can correct and get them through their trauma, they won't reoffend. Let's d- address the real issue. Right, there's a crime. They paid the price for the crime. What we don't want them to do is to recidivate. Right? We want them to move past their trauma, heal, and move on, right? In order to do that, peel back the onion, they have to have a rapport with the community. They have to have a rapport with the agency that's providing the service. They have to have a rapport with the provider, us, right? So we're more, we're very, um, we allow our clients to be authentic, transparent, honest, give what we need to hear your truth. They're the expert of their lives. Sure. This is where it happened to me, Mrs. Galloway. It started right here. We can help them find that place. Where did it start? 
we know that domestic violence, if you are exposed to domestic violence as a kid, it, it, it disturbs, it disrupts, it interrupts the developmental stage of a child. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. And so you've got a, a man who has been raised in a family where domestic violence has been an everyday occurrence. Now, does he grow up to be an abatterer? The possibility is there. Does he grow up to be a, a man that won't beat his wife? The possibility is there. But what happens to the man that is not able to make that curve over that bell to not get um, to get the help he needs, to get the counseling, to get understanding that it was not his fault that his mother was getting beat up. Sure. It wasn't his fault because he couldn't beat up the boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's trauma. That's right. Um, what I'm describing is adverse childhood experiences. And when you have that happen to a individual and they don't get that address it goes unaddressed all through their childhood now you got a traumatized child that now goes into adulthood who's now a traumatized adult so the system is failing to recognize Early how signs. to heal the trauma from of the, the individuals start of the individual yes and yes. You have also successfully paved that way through your Pathways program. Yeah, the Pathways program was the Pathways program is through Urban Ventures. That is a prosecutor led program that City Attorney Hing and uh, Susan Siegel have led and approached and asked if we can address, as they spoke with us, if we can address the trauma, will this reduce the recidivism? Indeed, it will. We have seen success in that program. I mean, it's huge. It's got to be over 75% success rate in that that, uh, Pathways diversionary program. And with that comes the, the nine months that we concentrate on addressing healing their trauma. We address anger management. We address cognitive behavioral thinking. Right in their therapy, because how a person thinks determines how they feel and how they feel determines how they're going to act. But if they have trauma that, that's unaddressed, you still got a problem. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so that Pathways program with Urban Ventures and the prosecuting led idea has been great. We have done this program now for four to five years and the success rate is above 75 percent. Those that are going on and they're not recidivating you know and that's what this is about first time gun offenders this is you can't you can't say that second chances don't work because they do because we're running the program we've seen the success mayor fry's baby this is his baby right and we're grateful for the opportunity to continue to serve those persons that are deserving of a second chance a person's mistake should not define them Right. And the society needs to get on board with that. Um, when I say society, the ho- society as a whole. Sure. Sure. Don't ask them what is wrong with them. Ask them why they did what they did. Ask them what is going on with them. Get to know the person. Sure. Right. Build the rapport, the relationship and the pathways program, like our choice program here at Wellspring Second Chance Center. We're dealing with people that have lived experience. We are dealing with people that really desire to see them change their trajectory without judgment. A person's mistake should not define them. Wow. Desira, I want to say it again. You simply do amazing and impactful work for our community. Wellspring Second Chance is identifying how society should shift their mindset in working with returning citizens and the youth and families that have experienced trauma. I have learned so much about the need for mental health services and certainly the need to improve how industry change its way of helping. Next week, we host another amazing trailblazer, Noel Nix, Director of Community Initiatives in the City of St. Paul, Mayor's Office of Melvin Carter. Lastly, Don't forget to smash that like button, comment, and share your thoughts on this episode, entrepreneurship, and workforce in general. And remember, go after that low-hanging fruit, my listeners, but always look up at the tree filled with ripe fruit. Until next time.